In order to be successful for today's instruction, you need to have your focus, your study guide, and your whiteboard out and ready to go. We have a lot to cover. On your whiteboard, let's do it. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is it called when an external stimulus is converted into a neural impulse? On your whiteboard, please tell me what is it called when an external stimulus is converted into a neural impulse? I got one, two, three, four. Hayden, what is it? Transduction. On your whiteboard, please tell me where does transduction occur in the eye? Please tell me, where does transduction occur in the eye? No, that's just carrying the neural impulse. What is it, Emily? Retina. Retina. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of the sense organ in the ear that houses where transduction occurs? What is the name of the sense organ in the ear that houses the transduction? Good. What is it, Annie? Cochlea. Inside the cochlea, it is lined by what sense organ? That is where actual transduction begins. Good. What is it, Nina? The basilar membrane. Yes, ma'am. The basilar membrane has what sticking out of it? The window. What is it, Emerson? Cilia. The cilia, every time it moves, it moves because what is pushing it around? Good, I got one, two, three. What is it, Camden? Mucus. Okay, so the mucus makes the cilia move. The cilia send uh, neural impulses into the basilar membrane. All of this is honed in the cochlea. On your whiteboard, what is a fancy name for eardrum? That's a fancy name for eardrum. Good. What do you got? Lindsay. Lymphatic membrane. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the clear glass that goes over your eye call? That's what you put your contacts on directly to. What is it? Jessica. Cornea. On your whiteboard, please tell me. What sharpens the image as well as flips it upside down? You're going to eat cheese. It's in my room like that. I see you. You know how much I love them, you jerk. I see that. That's exactly how I like them. What are they, Luke? Lens. Lens. On your whiteboard, please tell me, in your ear, what keeps our balance? What is it, Caroline? Semicircular canals. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is. Please tell me what is the name of the muscle that moves your eye side to side, up and down. Good. What is it, Margo? Scalera. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the colored part of your eye that's actually a muscle that makes your pupil. Large or small? What is it, Sophia? Iris. On your whiteboard, please tell me what are my three layers of photoreceptors? Good. Real effort. All that effort. What are they, Corinne? There you go. All right. Here we go. On your whiteboard, please tell me. Actually, I think we're okay because we went over some of that. So, today the goal is to fill in as much as your focus and your study guide as possible. I do want to head to our theories of light first, and then we'll kind of make our way back through it. So, we're going to be looking at your focus first and go from there. If you see, we have the light theories. Now, if you look on your focus, you have some diagrams on there of your eye and your ear. All of that, you just have to look at your diagrams and fill that in. Shouldn't be too bad. Can we agree? Yeah. So, because tomorrow you have tons of questions on the actual components of your ear and your eye. What does this part do? What does this do? All of those. How does transduction occur in your ear? And you have to go from pinna to tympanic membranes to on sleeves and all that stuff. So um, you have to make sure you know your diagrams. Tomorrow you are turning in your diagrams for points. 
So if you are behind on your diagrams, you should make sure you have them ready to go. Um, and you also have some theories. I will tell you, next week is all theories. And so we're going to start with that. So color theories, okay? Color theories is how we see color and focus. Now, just listen. We're going to get you to where you need to be. Okay, so this is what your eye, of course, we've talked about the anatomy of the eye, is over here. Now, the anatomy of your eye, of course, your cornea, your lens, your pupil, and all that stuff is happening here. But when you send a message from your, uh, your retina to your optic nerve, what happens is because your occipital lobe, which is the one processing all your visual information, is in the back, what we have in the middle of our brain is called the optic chasm. So all the information on the left side of our left brain has to be matched with what is on the right side of our brain. So what happens is our eyes, they foster information and they fuse it, fuse it together in our optic chasm. So does that mean our eyes are seeing the exact same things at the same time? No, they're not. They don't see, they don't process everything in the same exact pattern. Because if they did, how many eyes would we have? We'd have one. We'd look like Mike Wazowski, right? Okay? We don't. We have two eyes, which means they're separate from each other, so they have a slightly different perspective. It's the optic chasm in our brain that forces those two images together, so we have to kind of rectify it. Like, for instance, every moment of your life, your eyes see your nose. Every moment of your life. However, your brain gets tired of saying the nose is there, the nose is there, the nose is there. The nose is there. So now, unless you think about your nose, you don't see your nose. Think about your nose. Do you see your nose now? Then I'm talking about how big your nose is sticking up in front of everyone. It's the only thing we can see. Now that you are thinking about it, now you can see it. That is because your optic chasm has decided not to look at it unless you're thinking about it. Isn't that pretty cool? So because of two different eyes, two different sets of eyes, two different placement, they fuse these things together. That's why we have different theories on how we see color. What do you got? So like in the middle when they crossed over, mm -hmm. um, it's like what happens if that gets like cut or like severed or something? Then you're blind. Okay. Yeah, you're just blind. It just doesn't work anymore. So dark adaptation, which is on number three on your focus, by the way, is the first thing we're going to start at. So number three on your focus is where we see dark adaptation. Dark adaptation is the recovery of the eye's sensitivity to visual stimuli and darkness after exposure to bright light. Okay? Dark adaption is when when the lights go off immediately in a super dark place. You know how you're like stumbling around and you walk into things and all you hear is ouch! And then, damn it! And then some other curse words thrown in. Okay? That is because we're used to seeing things in the light. When the lights go off, our eyes haven't adjusted. So, eventually, if I lock you in a dark place for a while, your eyes will adjust and you'll be able to walk around without kicking things and punching things and cursing, you know, to high heavens, okay? That's called dark adaption. When your eyes are not used to seeing in the dark, so once they are given time to adjust, they can go ahead and see a little bit in the dark. Like, for instance, when you go outside, I always think of, like, going outside in the summer, even though we live in, like, perpetual summer. When you go out at night and it's dark out, you walk out and you're like, I can't see anything. Why are we out here? And then like 20 minutes later, you can see everything kind of perfectly and it's a really beautiful night and you're enjoying your evening outside, yes? That's for light adaption. Light adaption is the recovery of the eye sensitivity to visual stimuli and light after exposure to darkness. I personally think this is the worst, okay? Have you ever been in a movie theater and left the emergency exit? That is just a swift kick to the face. <laughs> oh, and it's, yeah, and like you go outside immediately. It's not like you walk through the movie theater and you kind of ease into the light. You go right out the emergency exit and you're just like smashed in the face with all this light. And it burns, doesn't it? Yeah, like it really burns. That is called light adaption. So it's the eyes have adjusted to the dark. Or like if you ever spend a long time outside in the dark and you go inside and use the bathroom and you turn on the lights and you're just like, God damn it. Or like, or when your husband just smashes through the room in the middle of the night and trips on the dog so he turns on the light and then you're just like blinded in the middle of the night. <laughs> also, okay, light adaption. We're very happy, married, happily married baby. 
very happy. Are we done? quickly and efficiently without burning your retina on either side. Okay, so color vision. There are three major color vision theories that we have that you have to know for the AP exam. The first one is young Helmholtz trichromatic theory and this is one of my favorite. This is number four by the way. Okay, the trichromatic theory is a theory of color vision that proposes three types of cones, red, blue, and green. So your eyes can only process red, blue, and green, and they can blend together to make other colors. So that you have certain cones that are red, certain cones that are blue, and certain cones that are green, Okay, and those colors, those cones work together to process anything that's kind of in the middle. Now, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, if our eyes only can see red, blue, and green and all the colors that vary between red, blue, and green, that means there might be other colors on this planet that we can't see because our eyes can't see the colors. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that cool? What is so white and the power sign wasn't white? I'll see if it was like something wide. I just can't yeah. see what color is now. Yeah, for sure. Like animals can see colors. We can't. The dogs apparently see way less colors than we do. It's impossible. So. Also, you'll be all colors. It's pretty cool. Impossible. What do you got, Kelly? Wait, so are you, you're saying like there could be colors that are not on the we can see. Yeah. yeah. Because we can't see. Well, we can't be on the spectrum. We can't see. It's like impossible. I don't know. But because of our eyes are limited to the red, blue, and yeah. green, that yeah. would be the struggle. Yeah. Now, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, I'm pretty sure there is a test question that asks, what are the three colors of the trichromatic theory? So you need to make sure you know that it's red, blue, and green. Because yellow, I don't know. I'm not smart enough. Because <laughs> yellow is not a prime color, is it? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not an artist. I have no talent. I have never said I do. Red, blue, and yellow. I don't know. There you go. Perfect. See, Sydney? Coming in clutch. Here we go. So, how can we kind of prove this is correct? We're going to do a little experiment here in a second, and it's going to be pretty cool. I like doing this one. So, a thing called after images, and I believe that it's on your study guide. Okay, you do need to know it, so I'd write a place because there is a question on it tomorrow. After images is when uh, an image occurs when a visual sensation persists for a brief time even after the original stimulus is removed. So an after image, okay? Have you ever looked at something long enough and you close your eyes and you can still see it? Yes, that's an after image. Okay, we're going to do one here in a second, which is pretty cool. So after images occur, when you exhaust your eyes looking at something, it creates another image of it. And eventually it disappears pretty quickly. But pretty cool. What would be the example? Oh, I got one coming up, girl. We're going to do it. Ready. We can do that. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. I thought me moving in the room stressed you out. I'm not really sure. Okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you an image. Okay. And you're going to just stare at it. Okay. You're going to stare at this dot as hard as you can. Like, blink if you need to blink, people. I don't want you to go home and say you strained your eyes and AP sight. And Ms. Bennett ruined everything, okay? Just stare at it, blink when you need to blink, but try looking at it as closely and as intently as possible, okay? So look at it, as blink, uh, look at it, blink when you have to, okay? However, just keep looking at it. 
<laughs> now, I'm going to close the little gate, and you're just going to keep staring ahead like it's there. What? It blinked. It's red. It looks like the American flag. Yeah! That's pretty cool. Why does it look like the perfect American flag? Why? Kelly? That's like the yeah, because it's the reverse of the colors. The opposite of yellow in your cones is? Blue. Blue. The opposite of green is? Red. There you go. And that's why this is that cool. So, now, it is a theory. Okay? Uh, trichromatic is a theory. It is not a law. So, does it work every single time we put this theory to work? No, because it would be a law. However, after a measure says proof, that the trichromatic theory is at least a pretty good viable option. Can we agree? So, we have another theory you need to know. It's called the opponent process theory. It proves that the trichromatic theory is pretty right. But it's a theory which means it's not 100% correct. So, because if it was 100% correct, we'd call it a law. By the way, this is also on your study guide, by the way. So, the opponent process theory is the theory of color vision that proposes four primary colors with cones arranged in pairs. So, your green and your blue and your yellow and your blue. Okay. So, you have the opponent process theory, which believes in four colors. Red, green, blue, and yellow, and then you have your trichromatic, which believes in three, and it should be easy to remember because tri means three. Three. So, uh, you do need to know the colors associated with each one for your test tomorrow. It's a real fun fact. Right? Aren't we thrilled? Okay, so <coughs> trichromatic is three. The opponent process believes we have four. And then they work together. So when you see images, that are blue or yellow, it's because the blue and the yellow have blended together to create those images. When you see colors that are either red or green or a mixture of red and green, it's because those cones are together. We're not sure which one is correct. However, they are both theories and both have been proven somewhat slightly correct. Okay. Color blindness. Okay. Color blindness is the next component. It is on your focus uh, study guide flip okay uh, we'll get there in a second so monochrome blindness is when you have no cones or no cones that are working some people have red and green color blindness so their red or their green cones don't work and it is all sex linked anyone here colorblind it's pretty common in men men typically have it however I've had a couple girls throughout my teaching who are colorblind which is I think really cool because it's very rare in so, if you are monochromatic, this is how you see the world, okay? This is the original painting, okay? This is how you see the world. Everything is in grays and whites and blacks. If you are red, uh, red and green blind, then this is how you see. You don't see the vibrancy and you see things kind of mellowed out, okay? So, things are a little bit different. It's typically in men. Uh, men uh, typically struggle. So like typically even asking men overall, men see less color than women do. You know, for a fact, women see vibrancy, women see more variations than men do. Which is why when you're like, what do you think of this outfit, McCray? And then you put on another outfit and you're like, what do you think of this one? He's like, they're the same. They are not the same, McCray. That's because he can't pick up as many colors. Okay, now, if you can see there are there is one number in this one and two numbers in this one. If you can't see the colors, if you can't see the numbers, then you have a problem with your rods and cones. So does that mean you should go home and say, oh my god, mother, I'm colorblind. Uh, this needs to be reported. No, it just means your cones aren't working as sharply as other people. Raise your hand if you are, can clearly see one number here and two numbers here. Okay, so if you can't, there's nothing wrong with you. You just don't have stronger cones than other people. Okay, <laughs> This must be an eight or a three. It's an eight. If you say a three, because it is, uh, it is very like, there's colored. There's like an here. orange patch. 
Yeah, I mean, you can say it's an eight or a three, and this is a nine, and that's a six. Very cool. Yeah. So if you can't see it, don't be like, oh my god, I can't see it. I'm probably lying. Oh, no. <laughs> it's fine. Okay, and then we have your nearsightedness. Okay, sound. Okay, this is on your uh, bottom of your front of your focus, uh, study guide, by the way. A wavelength is interpreted as a frequency or a pitch. So you need to know wavelength is considered a frequency or a pitch. And it's either high, medium, or low frequency. So if we talk about a wavelength, we're talking about the frequency or pitch. So if it's a low wavelength, it's low sounding. If it's a high frequency, it's Thank you. It's different. We're dealing with a whole different sense of this point. So we're dealing with sound. So amplitude is interpreted as sound. How loud or how soft a sound is. Some people say I'm very quiet and delicate. Caroline was like, you've got to be kidding me. I know I'm not very. If you met my mother, she just like, smashes the whole world. Um, this is very loud. This is a really loud, high amplitude. Which is different. Then you have purity, also known as timbrite, which is the richness of a tone. I could sing a note saying, Do, Ra, Do, I messed up the pan scales. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, and then I have Camden say it. Sing it. Sing it. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So. Do, Re. <laughs> oh, my God. She sings really beautifully. That was not a very good example of it. Okay? If you heard me sing, and then you heard Camden sing, hers sounds beautiful. She has a rich timbre or rich voice. Okay? It sounds really nice. Mine is sharp and scratchy and sounds like someone feed a dead animal. That's what I sound like. I'm aware. Did you not hear me sing Britney Spears earlier? Okay. I'm aware. What do you got? What would the applications be for these? I would say loud versus soft. <coughs> that would be that would be amplitude. Help read the definition. Okay, hertz. Our cycles are waves per second. So it is a measure of frequency. The more hertz you have, the louder it gets. Okay. Alright, perfect. Okay. I think this chart's really interesting and I think you should see it. So, normal breathing is a 15. That's very safe, okay? A vacuum cleaner is th threatening to be in the danger zone of hurting your ear, by the way. So next time your mother is vacuuming and you're like, can you turn it down? You'd be like, you're in zone 70 of hurts right now. <laughs> you need to calm it down. I wouldn't do that. You're going to get slapped. But I'm just saying, you could use it. If you have anything above an 85 <laughs> to a 90, like a chainsaw or a subway train can actually damage your hearing if you're near it too long. A um, rock concert, typically, I know you people don't go to rock concerts, but just live with it, um, are about 110. So if you go to too many concerts, you can actually damage your ear hearing. Uh, headphones turn to the highest volume, no matter the setting, because there is no legal limit to headphones. So like you beats, like for instance, my husband drives a BMW and he has the upgraded sound. We never turn it up more than like halfway through because it's so damn loud. My Mini Cooper, the cutest car in the history of the world that sits outside, it's bright red, it's super cute. Literally, you cannot turn it up more than like three quarters because it's so damn loud. Like it literally hurts your ears and I listen to my music super, super loud. And it's like too loud. Um, that will definitely cause brain damage. Uh, so jackhammer three feet away is also too dangerous. What do you got? Why? It's cool. It's in my video. Okay, structure of the year. We've already kind of covered this stuff, so I'm going to go pretty quick, unless we need it on our chart, do we? Uh, parts of the, parts of the year. Perfect. What I would do for your parts of your year, ladies and gentlemen, is I would just write my list on your, may I borrow this for a second? For your parts of the year, I would do, you know how we did all the parts right here? That's what I would put there, because you're going to need to know how to hear. You know, the pin ad, then it goes to your tympanic vent, auditory canal, and all that stuff. Okay. Cochlea. Auditory nerve, we're good. There is a pitch. Do we need pitch in place? Yes. Yeah. So join me on pitch, people. You can do your writing from the stuff in a second. Why don't we do the things that we're here for? Okay, pitch. Pitch is the psychological experience of sound that corresponds to a frequency of the sound waves. Higher frequency is perceived as higher pitches. Okay? Joe. <laughs> 
I just see Camden dying back there, and it just hurts my feelings, okay? I'm trying to bring my content alive, Camden, okay? And I am throwing myself at, this, at the altar of education right now, and my humility is just being lit up by you. <laughs> the problem is, is I can't even take myself seriously while doing it, but I'm going to do it anyway, okay? <laughs> and then <laughs> me. <laughs> so if you could hear a difference in tone, that's pitch. Okay, like I I was in a chorus, so you know I'm talented. Um, I was an alto. I think we all saw that coming. I don't know if you saw how much you struggled with that, but. <laughs> That's about as high as I can get, and that is a high pitch. If you can hear the difference between that to me, that would be your pitch. Okay, we're moving on. Pitch theory, which should be somewhere, is there? This pitch. This pitch? No pitch theory. Oh, there is. There is there? Is there a pitch theory? No. Okay. Pitch theory you are going to need for tomorrow. How about we get rid of, let's get rid of, you need it because there's only one spot. I don't really want to cover um, perception. I don't want to deal with perception right now, so that's all next week. Get rid of perception and write in place theory, please. Because that's all next week is perception. This week is obviously sensation, next week is perception. So, sorry, Emerson. Theory of pitch that states that different pitches are experienced by a stimulation of hair cells in different locations of the organ of Cordy. Now, what that means is, ladies and gentlemen, is Cordy is what we talk about for the basilar membrane. They just have a different term for it, but you just need to know basilar membrane. <clears throat> and I'm going to draw a little diagram for you, you lucky ducks. I'm drawing it, you should draw it. I hate you. <laughs> no, I was like, it's actually good. I hate you so much. Don't try to be kind to me now when you have been nothing but mean to me today. You literally had to take off your glasses because you were laughing at me so hard. So let's not pretend. Okay. So, your place theory is the belief that certain pitches, okay, certain sounds that go into our ear through the auditory canal to the tympanic membrane, convert into the osteoles into physical movement, then the osteoles push and pull on the oval window that moves the mucus. The lower the pitch, the closer to the bottom of the basilar membrane. So this is all your lower pitches. These are all your medium pitches. And if you have a really high pitch, which I don't need to make that noise for you again, that really high pitch is going to move the cilia located here. So depending on what cilia is being moved dictates the pitch. So the pitch dictates what cilia is moved in what locations. So the lower the pitch, the lower the register, that means the early parts of the cilia are moved. Well, if it's a really high pitch, it moves the cilia in the center of the cochlea. It's pretty cool. Okay, so depending on the type of pitch dictates what how much movement of the cilia it is. Okay, so that's what I would write in my application. Okay, so depending on the pitch dictates what cilia is moving because of it. Things pretty cool. Okay, then we have frequency theory. You need to know frequency theory. You can get rid of. Timbre, oh, you should have timbre done. Okay, uh, why don't you get rid of additive color mixing and write, write in uh, frequency theory. Okay, frequency theory. Okay, so pitch theory is all about 
different pitches make certain cilia move, and only cilia move for certain pitches. Place theory, our frequency theory, says the faster the pitch, the faster the hair moves. Okay, so if I'm a cilia, I'm really throwing myself down on the altar of education today. I'm a cilia! And I'm a new kid. <laughs> you people better appreciate that. Uh, anyway, so if I have a low, low sound, I go, Ooh. <laughs> okay. So frequency theory. If it's a low sound, you go, Ooh, slow movement. But if I'm a high sound, and I, I can't even get that. <clears throat> <laughs> The higher the sound, the faster your cilia move. You're welcome. That is your frequency theory. So the higher the pitch, the faster the cilia moves, the slower the pitch, the more chill. Frequency theory. Memorable? Yeah. 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 All right. On the altar of education, friends. All right. Bali principle. You don't really uh, need to know. Bali principle is when one becomes overworked, Another one will pick it up. It's very rarely used. <laughs> Conduction hearing is on your uh, number six on your focus, by the way. Number six on your focus is conduction hearing. Conduction, this can result from a damaged eardrum or damage to the bones in the middle of the ear. So if you've gone too hard at a rock concert, a few people go to rock concerts. I love rock concerts, by the way. That's just my something. Uh, if you damage your ear, have you ever gone to like a concert? Whatever concert two people attend, rap I assume. Um, when the next day you know how you have that humming noise in your head? That's because you made your Osleys work too hard and they're cranky and they're not moving as sharply as they should. Uh, that is what is happening because of dam and damage to your ear. It's just on a larger, much bigger scale, of course, if you, you know, damage it too harshly. Nerve hearing. Uh, impairment can result from either damage to the inner ear or damage to the auditory pathways. Okay, so and that is like that can't really be fixed uh, as easy as conduction. If it's conduction, the you need just a um, hearing aid. Induction is just a hearing aid. That's how we can improve it. Unless it's like super super severe, then obviously a hearing aid wouldn't work. For nerve hearing, we put in a cochlean implant. Have you ever seen those attached to the skull of someone? Okay, and those actually replace the cochlea, which is pretty cool. Annie, did you have a question, my darling? Can you what? Can you go to my
Yeah, and that's what your taste buds actually look like if you do a... Isn't that weird? What are the larger? Huh? The larger bread. Oh, uh, those are actual taste buds, and those are moving things to your taste buds. Oh. Yeah, gross, right? Pretty cool. Yeah, smell. Smell is controlled by your olfaction, so when I need olfaction, I would write smell, so you know what is what. Your olfaction bulbs are just below the frontal lobes, okay? It is the fastest and most direct route to the brain, which is why when you smell something, you immediately think of something, correct? Like you smell like my mom makes the best apple pie. Every time I smell apple pie, I think of my mom. Like immediately, like you can't help it. I love apple pie. It is my favorite food in the world, okay? Now, it's another reason why people snort cocaine, <laughs> okay? People snort drugs because it's the fastest way for it to get into your system, which is why people snort cocaine and other people snort other drugs. I, we did pretty well today, can we agree? Yeah. And you already have pretty much everything out there on your stuff, so good luck to you. I tried real hard. Yeah, good night. Uh, the attractive is that it just makes sense. your book around. Bye guys, have a good day. My pleasure.